This presentation is delivered by the Stanford Center for Professional Development. Um, last time, we had gotten right to the verge of discovering the Fourier transform as a limiting case of Fourier series, and I just wanted to pick up where we left off and finish that off and then launch into our more f formal treatment of Fourier transforms and, and talk about how we're going to proceed. So we are about to to get the Fourier transform as a limiting case of, well, actually, there are two aspects to it. There's a Fourier, limiting case of the Fourier coefficient and then the Fourier series. All right, there's the, the, the analysis part and the synthesis part of the Fourier coefficient. That's a capital F, Fourier coefficient and the Fourier series. So when I talk about the Fourier transform, I'm sort of thinking of the two things together, but there's really two parts to it. And they both come out, uh, out of more or less the same analysis. All right, so let me remind you what the setup was and, how I, and what I mean by a limiting case. I, what, by a limiting case, I mean a non-periodic phenomena I want to model as a periodic phenomena as the period tends to infinity. All right? And I took a special case of this, or just as a, a case for illustration. So that is, I suppose I have some function which dies off eventually, so it's zero outside some interval. Now that's, ultimately we're going to drop that restriction. I'm just, I'm just taking this as a case to sort of model what the situation should look like. So I'm going to take the case, and this is, again, this was a setup from last time. So take a case where lo that looks like this. You have some function, that's f of t, which is zero outside some interval. I'm drawing it like it's positive, but it can be very general. All right? the, but the fact is that it dies off at some point. And then I periodize it. So you can imagine this is a very big interval to begin with, but finite. And then I periodize it. I take an even bigger number, capital T, and I look at it from, say, minus t over 2 to t over 2. That's supposed to, com that's supposed to represent one complete period. And then I periodize this function. So the pattern repeats. All right? So periodize to make periodic of period t. So think of t as big. And eventually we think of t as going off to infinity. All right, so I won't draw the picture, but again, the idea is I just take the same pattern and repeat it over and over again. All right, then, you can write down the formula for the Fourier coefficient, and you can write down the formula for the Fourier series. So what does the series look like? The Fourier coefficient looks like this. Ck is 1 over t times the integral from minus t over 2. Instead of integrating from 0 to t, I integrate over any period. So I, I take the, the period from minus t over 2 to t over 2. And then the formula is e to the minus 2 pi i k over t, t, that's how I wrote it last time, f of t dt. And the Fourier series, so that's the analysis part. That's decomposing f into its components. Uh, and the, complex, the corresponding complex exponentials are these. And then the Fourier series is to recover the function from its components as a sum from minus infinity to infinity, c sub k of e to the 2 pi i k over t times t. All right. And what you would, what you would like if you want to take the simple-minded approach of saying a Fourier transform, and inverse Fourier transform, and so on, is a limiting case of Fourier series as you let the period tend to infinity. You just like to let t tend to infinity here. But that doesn't quite work. All right. So you would like to just let t tend to infinity. And lo and behold, the formulas emerge. But it doesn't work. It doesn't quite work. All right. So instead, it doesn't work because you don't get anything. That is to say, the Fourier coefficient tends to 0. It doesn't work because ck tends to 0 as t tends to infinity. All right. So, what you do is a little kludge job here. It tends to 0 like 1 over t. That's what I talked about last time, and I won't repeat that argument. Because of that factor 1 over t in front, this integral is bounded if the function is fixed. And again, if the function is 0, uh, non-zero, only on the interval from a to b. So that doesn't, that's, not, that's ultimately not getting very big. So it grows to 0 like 1 over t. So you scale up by t. All right? Scale up by t. 
And what I mean is, I want to consider instead of 1 over t times the integral, I just want to consider the integral. And I want to view that as a, to anticipate what's going to happen, as a transformed version of the function, not evaluated at k, although the indexing here is on k, really it's k over t that's the important thing. All right? it's, again, I want to let t tend to infinity, so I want to emphasize that connection. So I want, to, I want to look at, let me just use this notation, or let me say write. f of f at k over t. All right, so that's a new notation. That's something I'm, I'm introducing to indicate this sort of scaled integral as the integral from minus t over 2 to t over 2 of e to the minus 2 pi i k over t times t f of t dt. And then the Fourier series here has to incorporate that 1 over t again because that, that does come into the coefficient. So the Fourier series looks like f of t is the sum from, I'll write it like this, k equals minus infinity to infinity. Um, this transformed, this coefficient, k over t, times the complex exponential e to the two, 2 pi i k over t times t times this factor 1 over t. This factor 1 over t is coming in there again because that occurs in the definition of the Fourier coefficient that I have to have that in there. I mean, the Fourier series is in terms of the Fourier coefficient, the 1 over t is in there. Okay. Now, I want to let t tend to infinity. This is all heuristic, all right? This is not a proof. It's an, it's an argument for what the formula ought to look like as a limiting case of the Fourier series, of the periodic case. All right, so now, let t tend to infinity. And you have to make an argument what the formula should look like. All right, and I said, I said this last time, and I want to say it again. The idea is that as t tends to infinity, these numbers, k over t, of course, for a fixed k, that's tending to 0. But the, but the idea is that k is also going from minus infinity to infinity. And what's happening here is that if you think of k over t as a discrete variable, it is getting a pro it's, a, it's approaching a continuous variable. All right, the spacing is getting closer and closer together. They're spaced one over capital T apart, one over t, two over t, three over t, four over t, and as t is tending to infinity, they're getting spaced closer and closer together. So the discrete variable is approaching, for all to see, a continuous variable, which I'll denote by s. All right, so the discrete variable. That's not a technical term, all right? I'm just reasoning again heuristically here. Tends to, or placed by, in the limit, a continuous variable, s. And s is going to range from minus infinity to infinity. All right? Fine. That is to say, this formula in the limit as t tends to infinity is going to be replaced by another formula. So you're right. f of f of s as the integral from minus infinity to infinity e to the minus 2 pi i s t, so k over t again is being replaced by the, by the, by the continuous variable s, f of t dt. But don't stop there. Also look what happens to the Fourier series as capital T tends to infinity. And for the Fourier series, which is here, you have to recognize this as a discrete, as a sum approximating an integral. All right? This is the function evaluated at the, at the variables k over t, k over t here, and as t is tending to infinity, these are being, these are approaching a continuous variable. The 1 over t here is like the delta s, you know, that comes in writing an approximating sum to an integral. So as t tends to infinity, what happens to the Fourier series? It is replaced by an integral. Replaced by the integral from my, replaced by this formula replaced by f of t is the integral from minus infinity to infinity e to the plus 2 pi, I'll, I'll write it like this, 
I'll keep the same order of the terms. The Fourier transform of F, or the Fourier, this, this thing which I'm going to now call the Fourier transform in just a second. F of uh, the, this, <laughs> the Fourier transform of F at S, e to the 2 pi i s t d s. Okay? Now, you really feel like you know, the clouds ought to open up at this point because something really very momentous has happened here, if only by analogy. All right, if only by a heuristic argument saying you want to view a non-periodic phenomena as a limiting case of a periodic phenomena, this is one way of doing that that leads to something that I'm going to spend the rest of the quarter convincing you is a good thing. All right, so let me say a bit more here. Again, this, this, this little journey here has been a way of making the transition from a case that we studied to a case that we haven't studied. The, the, fi the, the final step in the process is to declare victory. That is to say, and this is what happens in mathematics all the time, and this is what, th what makes it very frustrating often for people when they're reading a mathematics book to try to figure out what the hell is going on or where the hell do these formulas come from and so on and so on. You sort of erase all paths of discovery and you just declare, what do you know? I'm going to give the following definition. How about that? And that's exactly what happens. So that's what we do now. We just sort of declare victory. All right, I wanted to, I didn't want you to miss the steps in between. All right, there they are. Let me write it over here. Let me, I'll, I'll write, this will be our victory blackboard over here. I didn't want you to miss the steps in between because I actually view a very important part of this course is not just going over formulas and facts, but in trying to give you a certain feeling for how the mathematics develops in the context of these problems, all right? Because if you, if you sort of get used to thinking that way, it'll give you much greater power over the problems that you're likely to confront out there where you really have to apply mathematics using your own head, using your own thoughts, all right? So what I'm, what I'm describing to you is just the sort of process that you go through that ultimately results in a definition, all right? It ultimately results in the definition, but the steps along the way are often hidden, and I wanted not to hide them. All right, so we define, at this point now, you just say you declare victory. So if f of t is a function defined on the whole real line minus, t, from minus infinity less than t less than infinity, you define its Fourier transform by the formula that I just wrote down. The Fourier transform at S is this integral, minus infinity to infinity, e to the minus 2 pi i s t f of t dt. All right? So here, S also is a real variable going from minus infinity to infinity, but the Fourier transform itself is complex value because I'm integrating a function against a complex exponential here. I didn't say whether or not f had to be real or complex. As a matter of fact, in general, I don't want to make that, I, I, I want to allow either case, all right? So I, I'm, F can be complex, in many applications, of course, F is a real signal and, and um, that's fine, but it makes sense as far as the definition goes to allow F to be either real or complex. So I won't say anything more about that. Now there's a lot, of course, there's a lot more to say about the definition. One thing that's should be, should be stated right up front, and something I'll say more details about later is, of course, this de the definition is only good if the integral makes sense. All right, you know, to, to write down this integral, saying this is the Fourier transform, but you know, if you're going to if you're going to actually carry out this integration for a particular value of s, you know, you have to say something about whether the con whether, when the integral converges. All right, so you need to say something. We'll need to understand the convergence of the integral. Just like we needed to understand the convergence of the Fourier series, at least to a certain extent, we also need to understand the convergence of the integral that defines the Fourier transform. All right, and that's an issue, all right? But not only have we uh, been led to the Fourier transform, we have also been led to Fourier inversion. This is analysis, all right? The Fourier transform analyzes the signal, the non-periodic signal, into its component parts. What are the component parts? The component parts are a continuous family of exponentials, not a discrete family of complex exponentials, but a continuous family of exponentials, the e to the 2 pi i s t. All right? The Fourier transform analyzes f of t 
into its constituent parts. But now we also have Fourier inversion. Fourier inversion says that we can synthesize the function from its constituent parts. And that's the second formula there. That says that you're, you can, if you know the Fourier transform, then you can get back the function. That is, you have f of t, the signal, equals the integral from minus infinity to infinity of, let me write it like this, e to the 2 pi i s t, the Fourier transform at s, ds. You often think of t as the time variable, and you think of s as the frequency variable, and you think of the function defined in the time domain, and the Fourier transform defined in the frequency domain. You can think about it that way, but you don't always think about it that way, and I'll come back to that as well. All right, so, you, so you think of generally f of t in the time domain, the Fourier transform of s in the frequency domain. That is, uh, that is to say you think of t as a time variable, you think of s as a frequency variable. That's fine, but don't be wedded to that so completely that you're not willing to change your perspective. All right, the Fourier transform is a very flexible tool. It comes up in a lot of different contexts. T is not always time. S is not always frequency. And you do yourself no favor if you force yourself into thinking only in those terms. All right, it's good for many applications, but not for all applications. You will hear me say a lot, you will hear me rant, you know, about notation and sort of conventions and things like that, because this subject is fraught with difficulties as far as notation goes, as far as interpretation goes. Part of that is just because of the richness of it. All right? It's a very rich subject, and any rich subject can be abused in various ways. All right? And this is, I would say, not only no exception to that, maybe a, a, a real exemplar of the abuse <laughs> that can be heaped <laughs> onto, uh, onto different symbols in their interpretation. OK, now, I could summarize what I just said, actually, into what I consider a major secret of the universe, perhaps the most major secret of the universe that you will ever learn in your lives, certainly in this class, is that every signal has a spectrum. You call S in the frequency domain, or you call the values of the Fourier transform the spectrum. All right? And that's a term I'm sure you're familiar with. So if I can summarize this as essentially be this major secret of the universe, Right, soon to be appearing on YouTube all over the world, is that every signal has a spectrum, and the signal and the spectrum determines the signal. To say that every signal, now, like all secrets of the universe, this is painted with a little too broad a brush. All right? To say that every signal has a spectrum means that you could take a Fourier transform. But of course, there are issues there. Does the integral really converge and so on? All right? To say the spectrum determines a signal means that you can always invert it like this. It means, in particular, that this integral always exists. All right? And that's, there are also issues associated with that. But never mind that. Let's just concentrate on the majesty and really the, the enormous applicability and truth of this statement, all right? For, for most cases, and for the cases that you're certainly interested in, this or some version of this is true and can be a guide to happiness, OK? The Fourier transform, the, 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 the analysis and synthesis of a function are two ways of seeing the same thing. You can look at the function in the frequency domain. You can look at it in terms of its Fourier transform. Or you can look at it in the time domain. You can recover it from its spectrum. All right, the two different representations of the same thing. And if you have two different representations of the same thing, you have tremendous power over it. All right? They're equivalent. Knowledge of one is equivalent to knowledge of the other. You will not get anything more profound, <laughs> I think, in, you know, in any class, 
anywhere, anything. How about that? It's a way to start the weekend off. All right, now. Uh, let me introduce one other bit of notation now, so I'll have a chance to use it, although I'm not going to make much more use of it today. We'll certainly make, make a lot more use of it later. And that has to do with this sort of in, inversion formula here. That is, it, it pays to introduce a separate operator along with a Fourier transform, namely the inverse Fourier transform, which is defined in a very similar way, except for a change of sign. So it's useful. So again, the Fourier transform of f at s is equal to the integral from minus infinity to infinity of e to the minus 2 pi i s t f of t dt. All right? That's sometimes called the, for, the forward Fourier transform. Again, I'll, I'll, well, I'm thinking of the time. Then it's also useful to introduce the so-called inverse Fourier transform. And let me, let me call the function g uh, as the integral from minus infinity to infinity of e to the plus 2 pi i s t, say, g of s ds. All right. Now be careful about how the variable, and then, then, what, then this result, the fact that you can recover a function from its Fourier transform, asserts that this really is the inverse operator of this. All right, so Fourier inversion says Fourier inversion says that the inverse Fourier transform of the Fourier transform of the function is the function. And it also says, for that matter, that if I take the Fourier transform of the inverse Fourier transform of a function, I get back the function. Okay. Now, again, I don't want to get too far on a rant now, but, um, but just to start, or just to give you a little warning of, these, of, 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 the, of the things to come, you have to be careful when you look at this, all right? Uh, the role of the variables here. This, let, take a look at the definition of the Fourier transform, all right? You're integrating e to the 2 pi i s t. That depends both on s and t against a function of t. You're integrating with respect to t. What remains is a function of s, all right? That's why I call, use the notation, the Fourier transform of f at s. So it's an operation of taking the Fourier transform evaluated at the point s, all right? The operation is carrying out this integration, but in order to write that down, you have to evaluate it at a point. So you're evaluating at a point s, it's given by this formula. Likewise, for the inverse Fourier transform, I'm integrating e to the 2 pi i s t. That's a function of two variables, s and t. If I integrate against a function of s, what remains is a function of t. It's the inverse Fourier operation. Carry out the integration, I have to evaluate it at a point. And the variable to use here is t because I'm integrating with a function of s and t against a function of s integrating with respect to s. All right. So note two values here, actually. All right, notice that um, the Fourier transform at zero, so there's the operation of taking the Fourier transform, and then there's the operation, so to speak, of evaluating at a point. So the Fourier transform of f at zero is the integral from minus infinity to infinity e to the minus 2 pi i zero times t f of t dt. I plug in s equals zero into the formula. And so that's just the integral from, that's the average value of the function, or at least what you consider the average value of the function, f of t dt. There's no, you don't divide by the length of the interval because the interval is infinite. All right, but it's the, it's the integral of the function, it's the area under the curve if you want to think of it that way. All right? So the zero Fourier, the, the, the value of the Fourier transform at zero is the integral of the function. This is analogous to the zero Fourier coefficient being the average value of the function, the integral over one period. Here I don't have a period. And likewise, by the same token, the inverse Fourier transform of a function at zero, of g at zero, is the integral from minus infinity to infinity. I integrate the Fourier transform times e to, uh, e to the zero. I'm, I'm not writing that this time. I'm just giving you the final answer. Um, so the integral from minus infinity to infinity of the Fourier transform, that gives you the value of the inverse Fourier transform at the origin. Okay. You have to always tell yourself and be clear what the role of the variables are in these expressions. Trust me, it becomes an issue. When the formulas get a little bit more complicated, as they will, how the variables are used and keeping that straight is something that you have to be careful about. Something you have to be careful about. Okay, now, so 
We've gotten to the stars of the show, the Fourier transform, the inverse Fourier transform, and the idea of Fourier inversion. It, it is now the, my responsibility for the rest of the quarter to convince you that this was worth it. Right? That is, that these really are useful operations to consider, and that they um, can tell you much that is worthwhile, uh, in, certainly in applications. But not just in applications, but certainly in applications. And I want to tell you how we're going to proceed. Actually, we're going to proceed to develop the ideas here in a way very much like, in a path, very much like the one you followed when you were first learning calculus. All right? If you cast your mind back to those happy days, when the world was new, calculus was just an attraction on the horizon. When you were learning calculus, the path you followed, we learned about derivatives and integrals, all right? The two basic operations of calculus. And the way you did it and was you learned general, you learned specific formulas, like derivatives of exponentials, derivatives of polynomials, derivatives of tree functions. You used and integrals of corresponding integrals. And then you learned general properties. You learned how to differentiate. You learned the product rule, the chain rule, integration by parts. So you learned specific formulas that, you, that are going to come up often enough that you want to know how to differentiate a specific function. But functions come up in combinations, products, quotients, compositions. So you had to learn also general rules for taking derivatives. You had to learn the product rule, the chain rule, and so on. And then, of course, you learned the applications of derivatives and integrals. All right. Now, also, in, in connection with the Fourier transform, let me call your attention to a, fact, to, a, to a problem or to a challenge you face in calculus. The integral is a very rich operation. I'll, I'll come back to this. I'll say this again later. But when you first learn about the integral, you learn a certain interpretation of the integral. You learn the, usually as a, some sort of motivating problem, like the integral is the area under the curve, or you recover the total change in the function from its rate of change, or so on. But the integral is a very rich concept, and you do yourself no favor by clinging to one particular interpretation of the integral in all cases, because maybe that interpretation won't really be a guide or won't really apply. Well, again, as I was just saying a minute ago, that's a similar sort of thing with the Fourier transform and the inverse Fourier transform. It has certain interpretations. The variables often have certain, certain interpretations, time or frequency. But you do yourself no favor if you cling to those particular interpretations and try to impose them where they don't necessarily belong. However, we're going to follow a similar path to the one in, or not however, but, uh, but uh, analogously, we're going to follow a similar sort of path when we develop properties of the Fourier transform. That is. We're going to need to develop specific transforms, transforms of specific signals, the kind of signal society needs, all right, the society runs on. And then we're going to develop general properties of the Fourier transform. That is, what to do when signals are combined in certain ways. Actually, in the way they're combined is a richer, in many cases, a richer, operate, a richer set of operations than the ordinary functions of, that, you, that you work with in calculus, the ordinary rules of calculus. Uh, and then, of course, we're going to talk about a lot of applications. Of, of these ideas. It's very similar in, its pa in the past, somehow, um, to the way that you studied calculus. And I say that again because I hope it gives you a way of sort of organizing your own study of it. All right? Realize at each stage, here I'm learning a specific formula, here I'm learning a general formula, and so on. And, it'll, it'll help. and here I'm learning an application, and this is the interpretation in this case, this is the interpretation in that case. It'll help you, I hope, sort of organize it in your head how the subject is evolving. Okay. All right, so let's look at a few, let's start on that path. And let's look at a few examples, basic examples. That is of calculations with a, with a Fourier transform. Now, I'm only going to do a few of these because unlike calculus, when you first learned calculus, your teacher, I hope, you know, showed you how to do a lot of calculations in a lot of specific cases because all was new, all right? I'm not going to do that, that now. I'm going to do some, a, a few specific calculations to show you the kind of techniques that always come in or often come in. But you can read the derivations. You can do the derivations. There's no new techniques involved there. All right? only, the techniques are, are, are integration, either integration by substitution, integration by parts, direct integration, whatever. That's not new. What's new are the, are the specific formulas that come up. And that's something, again, that I am going to leave to you to read, derive, learn, memorize, whatever. All right? I want to spend a little bit more time uh, on, the, on, on developing some of the general properties because there, there are some new things. There, there are some interesting things that, that you, you haven't seen before or haven't seen other than uh, in this context. All right, so the first example, I want to take the very simplest one, one that we've seen actually, you've seen in some homework problems and we saw actually even in the context of Fourier series, that's the, the function that models a uh, signal that's on again and off again. Or in this case, since I'm not, I'm not looking at the periodic version, it's just either on or off. And that is the so-called rectangle function. Pi of x, this is the notation I'm going to use. This I think was advocated by Bracewell, and it's not bad. I, I, I'll explain, I'll, I'll call it, actually I'll call the variable t. 
Why not? Um, I'll explain why I use this notation in just a second. It is 1 if absolute value of t is less than 1, and it is 0 if absolute value of t is greater than or equal to 1. So its graph, so it's defined for all values of t. And here's 0, here's, here's, excuse me, here's minus 1, and here's 1. So it's actually, yeah. I want to get a little careful here. No, no. See, I already got it wrong because it, there's not universal convention here. I'm sorry. I want it to be. I want it to be of width one, not 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 width two. So I'm going to take one half, one half. See, I already messed it up. Damn. Okay. It has total. It has total width one. So it goes from minus a half to plus a half. It takes a jump, minus a half to plus a half. It takes a jump, and it is discontinuous at the endpoints. All right. So. It's 0 in between the endpoints, and from 1 half and minus 1 half on, it's, it's, excuse me, it's 1 between the endpoints, and it's 0 outside the endpoints. Now, this is not, and it's called pi, because pi looks like a rectangle. And, isn't it stupid, right? <laughs> and the, I feel like, an, I mean, I feel really, you know, sort of, sort of juvenile saying that. But, and, or it's also sometimes called the top hat function, because it's supposed to look like a top hat. You know, as it goes up, 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 down. It looks like a rectangle. So it's also called, more grandly, it's sometimes called the characteristic function of the interval from minus a half to a half. It is sometimes called the indicator function of the interval from minus a half to a half. All these terminologies are in day-to-day -day use, all right, depending on the field. Um, I would actually tend to call it, in mathematics, you tend to call it the characteristic function. So I would have tended to call it the characteristic function, but I won't do that anymore. I'm going to call it the rectangle function. And there's also a certain amount of debate about how to define it at the endpoints. All right, I define it a certain way at the endpoints. Other people would define it differently. Other people would have it to be 1 at the endpoints. Some people would have it to have value 1 half at the endpoints because of this idea somehow at a discontinuity you ought to look at aver the average value. I mean, this becomes a religious issue with some people, you know, how this function should be defined at the endpoints. I do not want to get dragged into it. It will never make any difference for anything we ever do. All right, so this is my definition. You don't like it, go to hell. <laughs> All right. So what is the Fourier transform? The only recourse we have to calculating Fourier transform is the definition. All right? There's nothing else to work with. So you have to carry out the integration. One has to carry out the integration, I should say. So what does one do? One writes the definition down. The integral from minus infinity to infinity, e to the minus 2 pi i s t pi of s d pi of t dt. Careful about which variables we're using here. I'm sorry, I've already, I've already got myself a little crowded. So the integral, once again, the integral from minus infinity to infinity, e to the minus 2 pi i s t pi of t dt. Okay? All right, now, pi of t is only non-zero from minus a half to a half. So the only thing that remains here in the integral, it's not an infinite integral. It becomes a finite integral because the function is 0 outside that interval. So it's the interval from minus a half to a half, e to the minus 2 pi i s t dt. You integrate that like you integrate any exponential. The fact there are complex numbers in there does not matter. All right? the, car the carrying out the integration can, is the same as ordinary integration in calculus. So that is minus 1 over 2 pi i s. You're integrating with respect to t. All right, so you're regarding s essentially as a constant as far as the integration is concerned. So it's minus 1 over 2 pi i s e to the minus 2 pi i s t evaluated between t equals minus a half and t equals plus a half. All right, that's the only thing you can do. You, you, have, to, you have no recourse here other than to use the definition. So let's do it quickly. So that is, what do I get? I get at the, at, the, at the top end point, I get minus 1 over 2 pi i s e to the minus 2 pi i s times 1 half minus minus 1 over 2 pi i s. The only thing you can get wrong here is, you know, like minus signs and things like that. All those problems that you used to have, you have trouble keeping straight in calculus well. I'm sorry they haven't gone away. The same sort of issues are there. Minus 1 over 2 pi i s e to the minus 2 pi i s minus a half. 
So that's minus 1 over 2 pi i s e to the minus pi i s. Minus a minus gives me a plus 1 over 2 pi i s e to the minus minus gives me plus pi i s. Or if you will allow me to write that differently, that is 1, uh, one over pi s. 1 over 2i, well, right, like this, e to the pi i s minus e to the minus pi i s divided by 2i. And I write it like that because you have to start to recognize how to manipulate these complex exponentials to bring in, when, is, when, when called for, the ordinary trig function, sines and cosines. And e to the pi i s minus e to the minus pi s over 2i is the sine of pi s. So this is the sine of pi s divided by pi s, and that's the formula for the Fourier transform, period. Okay? This is the most basic example, and actually, as simple as it is, it's actually one of the most important examples. It's one of the ones that comes up most often in applications. So I'll write it down. The Fourier transform <coughs> of pi, the rectangle function is the sine of pi s, divided by pi s, and this function comes up so often in applications, it is given a special name, it is called the sinc function. So by definition, the sinc function of s is sine of pi s divided by pi s. Now, that's a function actually, I'm sure any, any electrical engineer has seen this function, every electrical engineer in fact sees this function in their dreams. You also saw this function in calculus, let me do it over here because it's an example of sine of x over x, a famous limit. You know, what happens is x tends to 0. The limit of sine of x over x as x tends to 0 is 1. And the limit is s tends to 0 of sine of pi s over pi s is 1. So this function is actually quite nice. This function is continuous and even smooth. And the graph looks something like this. It dies off. It dies off like 1 over s. It's symmetric. It's an even function. That's a damn good sync function, if I do say so myself. So here's 0, 1, 2, 3. It has zeros at the integers. Minus 1, well, so, not so good, I guess, actually. It's supposed to be even. Minus 1, minus 2, and so on. OK? Now, you can look in the book. I have a picture of the sync function. I have many pictures of the sync function. But don't deny yourself the pleasure of going down to Sunnyvale driving down to Sunnyvale, going to the Fry's in Sunnyvale. Fry's, I'm sure, for those of you who are new to the area and may not know, is this huge electronics store. And the Fry's in Sunnyvale has an enormous neon sync function. All right, in living color, it's incredible. You go into that store and you see sync functions everywhere, right? They're on all the railings. <laughs> They're on the turnstiles. I mean, it's a nightmare, all right? So, and, there's a, and, there's a, and I, there, is, there is a picture. I saw that. I couldn't believe it. There is a picture of it in the book. All right? Everybody, every electrical engineer, I say, knows this function. Mathematicians think sine of x over x. What is the big deal? You know? But in fact, you know, a large part of the world's economy depends on this stupid function. <laughs> so go down to Fry's. See it live. I'd like to, I'd like to, hold, I'd like to, I'd like to imagine the whole class standing there looking at it you know, one, <laughs> one Saturday afternoon and having the people from the store go out and saying, can I help you? Customer service? You know? What can I do? Are you here to return something? All right. Who has been to that fries, by the way? OK, I'm not, I'm not making this up, right? Yeah, all right. But for the rest of you, oh, what a treat you have in store. All right, now let me look at a couple other examples, all right? Because I, all I want to do is I want to I show you that, again, you have no recourse other than to the definition. So if you're asked to compute a specific Fourier transform, sometimes there are tricks. But more often than not, it's just a question of carrying out the integration. So all those you know, hard-won skills of integration by parts, integration by substitution, and things like that, those are going to come into play when you actually have to calculate specific Fourier transforms. Uh, but again, it's like you know, tables of integrals. People have done this, and so the, 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 you know, the, the collective hard-won experience is already out there, but you have to know a certain amount of it. And a certain amount of this, I think, you have to do for yourself just so you have the confidence in doing the calculations, just so you see how it goes. So related, actually, to the rectangle function is the triangle function. Remember of the first homework set that everybody loves so much. The basic triangle function is 1 minus absolute value of t if t is less than or equal to 1 and uh, 0 
if t, absolute value of t is greater than or equal to 1. And it looks like this. Um, the graph looks like this, called a triangle function because the graph looks like a triangle. It goes up, it go, it's 0 outside the interval from minus 1 to, to 1, and then it goes up with slope 1 up to a height of 1. Okay, nothing to it. It's a very simple function. But it's a very important function in itself. What about its Fourier transform? So the Fourier transform of the rect of the triangle function evaluated at s is, again, the integral from minus infinity to infinity of e to the minus 2 pi i s t lambda of t dt. Don't skip this step, all right? Write that down so you realize what you have to write next. And what you have to write next depends on how the function is defined. The function is 0 outside the interval from minus 1 to 1, so it's only the interval from minus 1 to 1 that you have to worry about, but the function comes in two pieces. It has a different formula on the interval from minus 1 to 0 and on the interval from 0 to 1. And they have to be treated separately. So this is the integral from minus 1 to 0 of e to the minus 2 pi i s t. And on the interval from, from minus 1 to 0, what's 1 minus absolute value of t? t is negative there, so it's 1 plus t dt. And then on the interval from, one to z, uh, from 0 to 1 is e to the minus 2 pi i s t times the formula for the uh, triangle function on that interval, which is just 1 minus t. You cannot avoid this. All right, You cannot combine these integrals. I suppose you could do a little bit, you know, but, but basically you cannot combine these integrals. You have to do the integrals separately. So how do you do them? Well, I'm not going to carry it out in detail, but I want to say just enough so you get a, a, a feeling for the kind of calculations that you have to do. Similar to the cal actually calculations you did when you were calculating Fourier coefficients, there are only a few techniques that are, that are in play here. All right? And in this case, the technique is integration by parts. All right, that's what, that, that comes up. So let me remind you of the formula for integration by parts. The integral from a to b of u dv, this is everybody's favorite, is uv. Of I, what, what you sometimes don't remember is what integration by parts looks like for definite integrals. So the integral of u dv is uv evaluated between a and b minus the integral from a to b of v du. And we all know what that means. What that means is that in your integrand, in your original integral, you have to identify what the u part is and what the dv part is. And I'm not here to teach you calculus, but that's what you have to do. All right. So what do you do in this case? So let's just look at the first integral. Then we'll wrap it up. So let's look at the integral from uh, minus 1 to 0 of 1 plus t times e to the minus 2 pi i s t dt. So looking at this, you have to decide. You have to look deep in your soul and decide what is u, what is dv, and what are the consequences of that. All right. Well, let me tell you, all right? u, in this case, you take to be 1 plus t. And dv, you take to be e to the minus 2 pi i s t, dt. All right, you do that because you look ahead. You are no fool. And if you take u equals 1 plus t, it's going to simplify things on the, on the other part of the integral because then du is just going to be dt. du is dt. And then if dv is equal to e to the minus 2 pi i s t, v is equal to, you integrate with respect to t, that means you're regarding s as a constant, so it's minus 1 over 2 pi i s e to the minus 2 pi i s t. All right? I love to integrate. I spent a lot of weekends home alone, you know, just integrating. A great icebreaker at parties. You like integration by parts? I do. So if you do this, then it becomes uh, then the integral from minus one to zero of one plus t e to the minus two pi i s t dt becomes u v. That's one plus t times minus one over two pi i s e to the minus two pi i s t evaluated between minus 1 and 0, all right, minus the integral from minus 1 to 0 of v du, which is, here's v, is minus 1 over 2 pi i s, e to the minus 2 pi i s t, and du is just dt. 
All right, so that integral has become simpler because now it's just the integral of a complex exponential. All right, you're integrating with respect to t. This s is a constant out here. Okay, that s is a constant out there. I have this right, don't I? Yeah. Okay. Now, I'm not going to take it from here. I mean, I love to integrate, but not in public. So, um, so I will not carry this out any further. But let me tell you what happened. But you can, all right, and you probably should. I think it's carried out a little bit more in the notes. And you have to do the same thing, same thing, uh, for the other integral. All right, the two integrals you cannot avoid this. All right, tough break, <laughs> but it's just the way it is. So you can carry out this integration, and what do you get? So you get. It's quite a nice formula, actually. You get at the end of the day, get that the Fourier transform of the rectangle function is sine squared of pi s divided by pi squared s squared. That is to say, it is sinc squared of s. Isn't that cool? The Fourier transform of the triangle function is sinc squared. Now, in fact, so once again, the Fourier transform of the, tri of the triangle function of s is sinc squared s. All right, now that's, I mean, I, you know, it's sort of fun, if you like that sort of thing, to see that emerging from this picture, but I'm not going to do that. All right, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to carry it out. In fact, we will, next week, actually see a different reason why this is true. I mean, it's actually not a shock. Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a deeper reason why this is true having to do with convolution. But that's, that's, that's a little bit in the future. It's just, but it can be done just by straight calculation, by no more than that. And again, for, for many Fourier transforms, for many basic functions that you need to know, that you'll work with, that you need to know the answers for, you have no recourse other than to carry out the integration to actually do it. All right? And again, I mean, you, and you should do a certain amount of that. I mean, this is one of these things where it's good for you to do. But it's true, just so, you're, just so you, you keep your facilities up. Because, you know, you're gonna, there, there are going to be times when you have to do that. All right, no numerical work. MATLAB won't do it for you. You know, you won't be able to find it in a particular table. You'll have to be carry it, you have to be, you have to carry it out. And again, the techniques are usually are not beyond what you've already done. They're typically involved either integration by substitution, integration by parts, something like that. That's all that's involved here. And, in, and carrying out integrating the complex complex exponentials is the same um, involves the same sort of steps, same sort of techniques as you learned in the real case when you were when you were just learning ordinary calculus. All right. All right, we'll wrap it up there. And then on Monday, I'm going to pick up again with a couple more examples and then also develop the general properties of the Fourier transform as we go on our path. Thank you all. Have a good weekend. <laughs>